Hello and welcome to another video on basic fiber optics. Today we're going to discuss stimulated Raman scattering. This effect, which is named after Chandrasekhar Raman, essentially describes how optical fields and mechanical vibrations in molecules interact with each other. And interestingly, it can be used for designing a fiber optic amplifier that's most likely being used at this very moment to stream the video you're currently watching. In this video, I'm first going to go over the basic physics of the Raman effect using the Humboldt H2 molecule as a reference point. Then we're going to expand that model to the case of an amorphous silica glass lattice. And then we're going to see how to design a fiber optic amplifier that exploits the Raman effect. Finally, we're going to see the numerical model of this amplifier implemented in Python, so stay tuned for that. First, let's take a look at the simple H2 molecule, just two atoms connected with an electronic bond. We're going to assume it's initially in its uh, vibrational ground state, and then we're going to expose it to an oscillating electric field, that is to say a photon with a certain carrier frequency. This will cause the uh, combination of the field and the molecule to enter a virtual state, which eventually will decay into some other configuration. Now most of the time we're going to see it decaying simply to a situation where we have the molecular ground state of vibration recovered, and then a photon coming out with the same frequency as the incident one, so that's kind of a boring case. But occasionally we also see the virtual state decaying to a state where the molecule is vibrating and we get a photon coming out with a downshifted frequency. In fact, the frequency of the photon coming out will be the initial frequency minus whatever frequency the molecule here is vibrating at. So it's essentially a mechanism that allows us to convert the optical frequency of a photon downwards to a lower frequency. So if you make a little spectrum or chart of all the possible output frequencies you can get, at least for the case of H2, it's simply going to look somewhat like this. We'll have the incident frequency um, coming out as well. That's what happens most of the time. But sometimes we'll get some photons that are downshifted by the vibrational frequency, and occasionally we'll get something that's downshifted twice, at least if we um, look at the um, vibrational um, mechanism as being a simple harmonic oscillator potential. Note also that the width of one of these spectral lines here will essentially be 1 over the lifetime of the, the virtual state. So that's all very simple for the case of hydrogen, but what if you have a more complicated structure, such as a silica lattice that's amorphous? So when I say amorphous, I mean the fact that it's sort of opposite of something more simple like salt with like very, very regular um, silica is just uh, sort of all over the place in terms of the molecular bonds. And I believe that's also the reason why people sometimes say that uh, glass is a liquid, even though it doesn't really pour the same way that water does. I think it's just like confusing the fact that, of course, water has a very amorphous structure because none of the water molecules are really bound together. And silica also has a very amorphous structure because all the molecules are sort of somewhat randomly arranged in this, this lattice. Um, but anyway, that's kind of a, a side point. The, uh, the point is that because of this amorphous structure, then we don't just have a single, like very clean spectrum of vibration states like we have with hydrogen. We have something much more uh, continuous because all of these different possible vibrations that uh, can be present in the lattice and all the different lifetimes sort of smears out the whole spectrum into this, um, this uh, thing we see right here, where we have sort of a peak close to 13 terahertz and some other individual pumps once in a while that's like quite broad. This is like 10 terahertz, I believe. So essentially this is telling us that if we um, send in a photon into this uh, lattice, then if uh, the Raman effect takes, takes place, most likely we're going to get a photon coming out that's downshifted by around 13 terahertz. That's the most probable case. But of course also sometimes we get something that's a bit lower, a bit higher. Also we can see that if we um, imagine exciting the um, vibrations out of this molecular lattice with strong electric field, like turn on and turn off, then essentially the average molecule in some sense is going to vibrate according to this wiggling function right here. So that's somehow the, uh, the Fourier transform of the spectrum up here. It's going to be this time domain representation here. We're going to take the Fourier transform to go back to this one. So we see that it sort of oscillates with a certain carrier frequency and also decays exponentially. So it behaves a little bit like a damped harmonic oscillator system, but with a few caveats, because you can see that, at least in this uh, vibration down here, it doesn't quite reach the dip we'd expect here, and even it like completely dies out, but then sort of recovers a little bit over here, which happens because, um, again, we don't just have a single sort of a carrier frequency with this, Actually, the carrier frequency, the single vibration frequency, we have a number of frequencies that all sort of contribute. Um, so anyway, the point is that if we send light into the uh, silica lattice, most likely it's going to be downshifted by around 13 terahertz, but if we downshift it by any value that's sort of inside of this spectral range here, the height sort of determines the probability of a certain frequency occurring. So you can even get to see how we could use that to design an amplifier. In fact, the way it's done professionally in actually uh, proper Brahman amplifier devices is that we have a number of communication channels going into a fiber from the left, and then we strategically chose, uh, choose some laser frequencies on the other end that are 13 terahertz above the uh, frequency we want to amplify. So the point is that if we send the communication channels into the fiber from the left, 
we can see that if we don't have any amplification, then they'll simply decay in power exponentially until they reach a very small value marked by the dashed black line here at the end of the fiber span. Maybe that's even too low for us to detect. But if we have a pump pressed going from the other direction, then in regions where the intensity of the pump is high, the channels are going to steal power from the pump because they're 13 terahertz below the pump. And you can notice that um, the amplification effect is stronger in a region with a high pump power. So actually the channels will get amplified a little bit in this region, but then more and more and more as they uh, propagate further and further to the, the right. Note here that the um, power of the pump is of course decreasing in the direction going to the left because it's being launched from right to left, whereas the, um, the channels will decrease in power from left to right. It's going to be a little bit important in a moment where we have to model this numerically. So you'll see about that in a moment. So essentially, to create a very, very crude, very simple model of this, we can just write down two coupled differential equations. So this one up here is for the change in the power of the signal as you move forward. And you can see that it's some kind of an exponential behavior, essentially, because it's the current power of the signal multiplied by a gain factor. And that gain factor both consists of the loss due to the attenuation of the fiber, but also the actual positive gain term here due to the transfer of power from the pump into the signal. And of course, that's mediated by this number right here, which is the Raman gain, which essentially you can calculate from the curve we saw before by just looking at the frequency difference between the pump and the, and the signal. Similarly, we can write down a similar equation here for the pump. Of course, that's going to lose power as you move from the left to the right, um, according to the strength of the signal. So here's kind of the important point about modeling this, is that um, because the pump is actually propagating from the right to the left and decreasing its power in this direction, we have to sort of do the simulation, assuming that we have a very low power pump starting at set equal to zero, which then increases in power as we go to the the right. So that actually means we have to flip the sign of this attenuation here, but that's kind of a small detail but still kind of important to be aware of. Another important thing here is this uh, ratio of the two frequencies of the pump and the signal. Essentially we have to include this because the, um, the Raman effect doesn't so much transfer power from one frequency to another one as it transfers photon number. Because remember the earlier slide we saw with the hydrogen molecule, we saw that we have one photon coming in and one photon coming out, so the photon number is always conserved even though the energy is not necessarily conserved by the, um, at least in the optical domain for, uh, for the Raman effect. So we also have to include this ratio here. But in a case where the, both the pump and the carrier, both the pump and the, um, the signal have a very high optical frequency, we can sort of assume that this ratio is very close to one. Like 13 terahertz is not very large compared to the, let's say 200 terahertz we're operating at. We can sort of assume this is just equal to one, at least for simplicity for a crude model. So with that in mind, let's take a look at a quick Python notebook I wrote in order to simulate this numerically. Stay tuned for that. All right, welcome back to this quick notebook I wrote in order to simulate the behavior of a Raman amplifier. So first I import a number of libraries and functions and constants that are gonna be useful later. And then I define a function that gives me the Raman gain spectrum that we saw earlier, the sort of uh, bell shape. If we plot this, we get the following chart here, where the way to interpret it is that if we launch a certain carrier frequency into a um, silica fiber, and then we center the uh, frequency at that carrier frequency, we can see it will tend to steal power from anything that's 13 terahertz above it, and it'll tend to donate power to anything that's 13 terahertz below. So if we set up a uh, frequency spectrum to simulate, we can um, set that around the, the C-band, and then choose a pump frequency that's 13 terahertz above, which means it's selecting something that's a couple of nanometers below 1550. Then we should uh, set a noise floor for all the different channels, I'm just setting it to 10 to the negative 10, just to pick some um, kind of arbitrary low value, and then I pick the power of the data channel to be around one milliwatt each, which is sort of a kind of a realistic um, real world choice for channel power in an optical um, telecom system. Then I also set the power of the pump at set equal to zero to be a very low number. Because remember that in the simulation, the pump is actually propagating from the, the right backwards towards the, uh, the left, whereas the channels are going from the left forward towards the right. So when we propagate the pump, in the forward direction, we actually have to make sure that it starts at low power and gains power because of attenuation. Because remember, it's losing power in this direction, but it's gaining power in the other direction. Anyway, that's something I mentioned a bit earlier, just important to keep in mind. So if we set all of this up and actually plot the spectrum, we get something like this here at set equal to zero. So if we launch in, we see that we have 10 to the negative 10 for all the frequencies down here. And we have a power of 10 to the negative 3, so 1 milliwatt for all the channels here in the C band. So remember, each of these is based around 100 gigahertz apart. And the blue dot over here that corresponds to the, the pumps, you'll see that's around 13 terahertz above this C-band range right here. Okay, so the next step is to actually set up the Raman gain matrix, which then tells us how much does each frequency uh, steal power from ones that are above and donate power to ones that are below. 
So if we fill out this matrix here using the um, function for describing the Raman spectrum, which we saw earlier, we essentially get a matrix that looks like this here. So what we see is that, for example, this frequency here, that's the 125th entry, will tend to steal a lot of power from the pump that's all the way over here at the final entry, and will tend to donate power to something that's around the zeroth entry. But of course, the um, let's say the 50th entry here will tend to steal power from the entry number 200, but it won't actually donate any power to anything below because it's kind of out of bounds for this particular case. But of course, we could expand that further if we really wanted. So now we're actually ready to solve the differential equations. So the way we're going to do that is by setting up this um, differential function right here. So for now, just ignore these three lines here and just con concentrate on this statement right here. So you'll see that we multiply by the intensity out here. And here we have a dot product between the gain matrix and the intensity vector. So in the slides we saw before, there's only a single pump and a single channel. But of course, if we expand that out to multiple channels while it's acting with each other, we essentially can um, compute the whole gain factor by simply computing a dot product, which is kind of convenient. Then of course we have to subtract the effect of attenuation. And again, in this very crude model, I'm just saying that all channels that are not the pump will have the same attenuation, but the pump will have one that's, uh, first of all, twice as big in magnitude, but also has a negative sign because the pump is of course moving in the other direction. So we have to simulate the gain or the, the loss being positive, if that makes sense. And of course, we can also solve all of this for a simulation where we don't have any Raman gain at all, in which case each single uh, channel can be modeled analytically as simply just an exponential change in the power with distance. And then we're going to take that um, power we defined earlier and just divide it by the cross-sectional area of the fiber. Because remember that um, the way that these differential equations are parameterized is the intensity change with distance, not the power. So we have to account for that in order to make sure that the uh, Raman gain matrix has the correct units compared to what we're multiplying with here. So anyway, now we can actually define a fiber that has a length of, let's say, 100 kilometers, and we can actually model the propagation of the uh, channels simply using the RK45 um, method for solving um, differential equations. And of course, we also simulated for the case of having no gain and just looking at a single channel at a time. So if we do that and actually plot the output, what we see is that throughout the length of the fiber, if we don't have any Raman gain, then the power evolves according to the black dashed line here, and it just becomes a very small value down here around the loss of a of that, like 20 dB. But as you see here with the green curve, if we do have Raman gain, then the green channel here will begin to steal power from the orange pump that's going backwards. And it's going to increase in power until we reach the end of the fiber. And so basically this difference here between the uh, green power right here and the black power down here, that's going to be the gain of the Raman amplifier. So another way we can look at that is to take a look at all the different channels that are present at the very end of the, the fiber. So in blue, we see the input spectrum that we also saw in a previous chart. In the black, we see the output spectrum if we don't have any amplification. But with amplification, we actually get the orange chart out right here. And we see that it's actually much, much higher up than the black chart right here. So clearly, amplification is taking place. Note also that the pump power starts off being very low at silicon zero, but then actually increases towards the um, towards the end of the fiber at L, which of course is the start of the fiber from the point of view of the, the pump. Note also that if we don't have any Raman amplification, the final power of the pump is actually higher than it is for the uh, Case where there is Raman amplification. So we can see that for the orange case here, some power has been donated from the pump into the range of um, frequencies that are down here. Also interesting to notice that power is exclusively donated to the frequencies inside the C-band. There's also a bit of power sort of spilling out both uh, before and after. And actually, if you um, go into a bit more detail, which I might do in a future video, then we'll uh, be able to see how the Raman effect can actually give rise to supercontinuum generation in lasers. So. Um, Let's also take a look at how this looks in a 3D plot. So we can see here that um, the power of the pulses, or the power of the channels, decreases steadily throughout the fiber. But then we begin this region here where the uh, pump power is significant, then they begin to actually increase again towards the, the very end. Finally, we can also compute the gain of the amplifier. So the way to do that is simply to take the orange curve from before and divide it by the black curve. Because remember, we're comparing the sort of with and without cases to each other. So taking the orange numbers here, dividing by the black ones, we get the following curve out right here. So what we see is that the frequencies inside of the C-band will have experienced a gain of somewhere between, I think it's like um, maybe 13 to 20 dB or something in, in that scale. So clearly a decent amount of amplification has taken place here. But you also notice that it's a bit um, not completely ideal because um, you notice that it's not completely uniform within that range. So frequencies that are located right here will tend to be amplified much more than the ones that are down here. So in practice, the way you actually solve that is to use multiple Raman pumps, instead of just a single one at 13 terahertz above, you sort of arrange them kind of close to each other, but still above the um, channel you want to amplify. And then you also vary their power in a way that will sort of uh, equalize the amount of gain experienced all the way throughout here. So that's kind of a 
tricky thing to simulate mathematically, of course, but it is possible to do. Um, and of course, you need a much more sophisticated set of differential equations than the one I presented right here. Of course, mine doesn't really take the, let's say, the frequency dependence of the loss into account. I also kind of ignored the, if you remember the little ratio of frequencies we saw inside of the differential equations, I also ignored that. There's a bunch of different ways you could upgrade this, but I think it still shows the sort of basic idea behind the Raman effect and how it's used in amplifiers to uh, help improve fiber optic data communication. So if you found this video interesting, check out some of my other material and stay tuned for more videos. Bye bye.